All right. Well, welcome everybody. And thank you. Sorry, I'm dropping things. Thank you so much for coming and for everybody who's uh, watching on recording. Um, and we are we are thrilled to have this uh, special, optional, but awesome Reading Week panel. And uh, Colin, do you want to go to the next slide? I'll do just a few announcements really quickly. So just if you're a student right now, do not, just to be clear, there is no seminar this week because we're in reading week and there's no short weekly assignment tonight either because we are in reading week and your short weekly assignment from last week is due next Monday, not yesterday because of reading week again. I don't know how many times I'm going to say reading week on this slide. Um, and then I wanted to mention um, there is, however, in the final assignment for the course, there are three options for the assignment. And the third option is linked to tonight, as is explained as the um, instructions. So um, if you are choosing the third option of the assignment, then uh, tonight's panel is, um, you have to watch it either live or in recording, uh, up to you. And then for students, again, your GTA is always available if you have questions, or you can also email us at unif2020 at uoguelph.ca. And next slide. And uh, tonight we'll do as usual. So we are using the Zoom chat. So um, when you have questions, you can type them up. We have a different format tonight than usual because we don't have separate presentation. We have one big presentation. So, but you can type your questions as you go along or after the presentation is done. And as usual, uh, Ryan and I will try to incorporate as many of the uh, questions as possible, or sometimes we end up combining them or they end up inspiring something um, as a whole together. And then um, for our panelists, uh, Don and Queen and Vanna, uh, feel free to read the chat, but you don't have to, um, we will handle it. So um, it's really up to you, um, but you really don't have to. And uh, next slide. So, <clears throat> yeah, we wanted to uh, give you a really, really brief kind of intro to how this panel came about. Um, last semester, there was a suggestion from one of the graduate teaching assistants that uh, it might be interesting for students in the course to think about contributing some of the works they had been creating for the course to uh, the ongoing collection project that was being uh, undertaken by the uh, Guelph Museums. And um, so this led to a conversation um, with Don Owen, who's the, uh, cu the curator of the Guelph Museums. And, you know, I think we started having a lot of really ex sort of exciting ideas about things we could do. And one of the things that um, became, I think, really obviously of interest was the fact that there's a rapid response collecting effort being undertaken. So when we talk about pandemics in the context of this course, we've been talking lots about the current one, but we've also mentioned a bunch of cases from the past. So we've talked about, you know, SARS, we talked about um, the 1918 flu pandemic, uh, we've talked about a number of different cases. And the information that is available to present about those past uh, cases is, you know, there because somebody has either collected it at the time or been, been able to reconstruct aspects of what the experience was like in, in that time. And so what uh, people like Don and others are doing now is basically capturing the, the current time so that it's there to, to uh, help us understand in the future how things went and to hopefully learn from this experience and so on. Um, but that also, and so we thought, well, you know, this would be a fantastic thing to introduce the students to, you know, how do you go about capturing a moment like this um, for, for posterity? And then we also were um, quite interested in the other things that are going on in, you know, at this particular moment in time. Um, the, you know, the massive um, influence and importance of Black Lives Matter, for example, happening, in, you know, in parallel with the pandemic. Uh, we've talked a bunch of times about how the pandemic is exacerbating existing inequities and really highlighting areas, uh, you know, problematic areas in society and so on. So we, in, we were uh, connected as well with Queen, who is um, executive director of the, the Guelph Black Heritage Society and uh, is also you know, uh, engaged in a lot of um, activities around 
the current moment, but also capturing um, what's happening. And I think both Don and Queen have, you know, articulated to us very, very nicely the, the importance of making sure all voices are heard in that process. So the other thing that we, we do know about past pandemics is often it, it, it's a bit of a, a narrow um, take on, on who was experiencing what. And that's partly because historically, um, you know, his collections might have been biased in one direction, in one direction and, and leaving out uh, many of the voices of people who were experiencing it and may have been experiencing it at a, at a greater severity, um, as we see again about the inequities being exacerbated. So uh, again, we thought, well, this is just a, a, a fantastic thing to bring up now, um, to talk about the, the moment in a broader context, but also how one ensures that diverse voices are heard and that diverse experiences are included in that record, in that, in that knowledge about the current situation. So um, we've had a couple of really great conversations uh, about how we can, we can um, incorporate that into the course and possibilities for future, um, you know, collaborations between the university and the community in Guelph and so on. Um, uh, and we also have uh, Vanna Chainani. I hope I, I really hope I got your name right. If I did not, didn't, please um, correct me. Um, who is a curatorial assistant uh, related to um, BIPOC heritages, heritages with the Guelph Museum. So again, this idea of an inclusive um, capturing of, of lived experiences during this really important moment. So we, we um, as you heard, are not gonna have a series of, of presenters like we normally do. Uh, we're gonna have, I think, a joint presentation um, and then we'll open it up to questions and discussion and as you saw and Sophie mentioned uh, there is an option to create something that might make its way into um, a collection in the Civic Museum as part of capturing the current moment so um, very much looking forward to tonight we're so grateful to have you all here and uh, as I said I think because it's reading week I think many people We'll be watching the recording and it will be made available to the alumni and students in the course. So again, uh, really looking forward to this. Okay. So hello, good evening, everybody. Um, my name is Dawn Owen. Uh, my colleague Queen from the Guelph Black Heritage Society joins me too. Uh, I'll say as well that uh, uh, just to echo what Ryan had said in his introduction, um, uh, Vanna Chnaney is also uh, with us uh, tonight uh, listening to the lecture. Uh, Vanna was not uh, thinking that she would be presenting tonight, but we certainly um, encourage her to jump in at any time that she feels that she'd like to, but not to feel any pressure at all to actually be formally part of the conversation. But I really appreciate the chance to acknowledge um, her contributions to, uh, to the museum, to the work we're doing in the community, and uh, specifically to this presentation. Um, and so thank you, Vanna. And thank you, Ryan and Sophie, for inviting Queen and I and Vanna to be a part of the course. Um, I wanted to start uh, where well, we wanted to start um, by sharing uh, the uh, a land acknowledgement. I'll say um, I'm not. You can see it on the screen. I won't be reading it out as you can read it yourselves. And I certainly want to acknowledge that um, we are all. Um, you know, located diversely, uh, listening in to tonight's lecture. I don't know how many places we're listening in from, but I imagine there are many. And uh, this is an opportunity for us to individually and collectively just reflect on the lands uh, upon which we are uh, situated at the moment, um, that everybody's awareness uh, and, and sort of learning journey in the context of treaty knowledge and um, land acknowledgement is going to be in a different place and we certainly uh, want to make space and accommodation for people in those different spaces in, the, in their learning journeys. Um, you know, I'm, I'm calling in from Cambridge. I think, Queen, you must be in Guelph. Yep. And, uh, and I think, um, you know, we're, we are, we share, we're on the same, uh, uh, you know, the same treaty lands. Um, and wanted to acknowledge that uh, through sharing this land acknowledgement as you see it on the screen. 
So I think we'll get uh, things started off by sharing a little bit about our, ourselves. Um, that's part of the what we like to call the positionality piece uh, in the work that we do both as individuals within our own sort of personal uh, spaces within our uh, close friend and uh, colleague groups, um, but also professionally in the work that we do through our um, organizations. And uh, as you know, my name is Dawn Owen. Owen I'm the curator at uh, Guelph Museums currently um, and have been in that role since about middle 2017. Um, prior to that, I was almost uh, just over 19 years uh, at the Art Gallery of Guelph, which for, for a long time was called the McDonald Stewart Arts Center at the university. And I'm sure there may be some people uh, listening in tonight who have an awareness of that space as well. Um, and so I really came to uh, civic heritage through um, uh, you know, a career based in contemporary art practice, working very closely with other creatives, um, working within and across diverse, diverse communities of people. And by diversity, I mean in that context, not just cultural diversity, but really human diversity. Um, and the priority was always around collaboration because in the art world, let's be honest, uh, your resources need to be shared in order to make the work that you do uh, in the way that you want to do it. Um, and so partnership, collaboration, co-creation were all central to the work that I was doing in the gallery space. And so when I transitioned from that space into civic heritage, I carried a lot of that um, expectation and priority around the work that I would be doing in my new role within uh, and carried that into the museum space. Um, I'll confess that I am not a traditionally trained art, his, uh, excuse me, I'm not a traditionally trained historian uh, in civic histories um, as I have always uh, focused prior to now on contemporary practices. Um, so a little bit of that uh, training and that experience feeds in certainly to the work that is happening right now in the museum. Queen, did you want to introduce yourself? Absolutely. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much again to Sophie and Ryan for having us out today. And um, I am so grateful for the lands that we are on and situated on today, especially as, um, you know, black bodies. And I'm so thankful for the ancestors that came here and gave me opportunities. But because of that, that's because of our indigenous brothers and sisters. So we're so grateful for those lands that we get to um, tell our story and our history and our heritage on today. And you'll hear a little bit about that. Um, my name is Queen. No, that's not my formal name. I like to call it my chosen name as I don't like to go by my colonial name. Um, but uh, I am executive director for the Guelph Black Heritage Society. It is one of the very many hats that that I wear um, within the work that I do. As executive director, I joined on last year, I can't believe it's almost been a year, um, in, you know, really trying to lighten and enlighten, sorry, rather the work of social justice and education. Um, we have a really important mandate at the Guelph Black Heritage about our Heritage Hall that you'll learn about. Um, but I also wanted to amplify voices in light of the murder of George Floyd. I personally have lost um, many to violence, uh, mass incarceration, um, systemic oppression, and the list goes on. Um, and it was time for me to make that difference. I was called to do some work and heavy lifting, to say the least. Um, and I try to use that work within any space that I do. I also own a company called The Queen Company, where it works as a marketing and business, small business, mostly company for BIPOC. Um, Black, Indigenous, and people of color to help support their businesses, help mentor, help, um, you know, gauge peer support so that we continue that education throughout when I am no longer around. And I also own a company called the Heels Academy that I co-own with two wonderful business partners. That is a dance adult company that's all about um, diversity in all spaces, BIPOC, LGBTQ to A+. Um, we really want to amplify the dance space as a place um, that it hasn't been for so long, which is accepting of all. Um, and so that is a really big honor for me. I choreograph for the Guelph Nighthawks basketball team out here. And I also teach dance at the University of Guelph starting again in March, which I'm so excited for. So excited to get back with the students because they're just these just beautiful spirits. So I wear quite a few hats in the city. A lot of my work is activism, advocacy in from my social media platform to the dance and the art that I create. So I'm really honored to be here speaking with you and with, um, I'd like to say more than a colleague and a friend, someone who brings me a lot of light in my days, Dawn, and really excited for this, um, 
piece that we're getting to share with you today. Thank you, Ryan. Thanks. Thank you, Queen, so much. Um, and uh, just to build on what Queen has shared in the context of the work that she does in the community, um, we wanted to kind of sort of uh, position ourselves and our organizational spaces and the work we do collaboratively and collectively um, in the context of sort of pre-pandemic era, uh, if we can even imagine what life was like pre-pandemic. Um, it feels like it was a lot longer, a lot longer ago than, a, than just a year. And uh, it surprises me uh, too, Queen, to hear you say that you've been in your role for only a year, because it feels like you've been in your role for much longer than that. Uh, you're so integrated and embedded into the, the fabric of this community. The, you know, um, yeah, just that it astonishes me. But it's a full credit to you and the work that you do. Um, so yeah, this gives us a little bit of an opportunity to talk about sort of the intersectionality of our practices. And I think intersectionality as a concept um, in the context of a discussion about the pandemic, about cultural expression, about the ways in which um, people today are not only capturing and documenting and witnessing what's happening um, both to themselves directly, but also to their immediate friends and family and their larger communities, and frankly, also nationally and internationally because of the fast pace of the way that we communicate um, and all of the social media platforms, etc. You know, there really is, aren't the same sort of boundaries or it doesn't take as long for us to hear about things, learn about happenings, um, for those experiences to, to translate, um, sometimes in error, sometimes with truth, a lot of times somewhere in between those two places, um, to us into the places where we live and work and play and, and love. Um, so we wanted to take a little bit of time at the beginning of the presentation to really center ourselves in sort of what we were doing just ahead of March of last year. For me in the Guelph Museums, um, you know, I had joined the museum in mid-2017, but as you know, I had been in the Guelph community for a long time. And uh, when I made that decision to move from sort of traditional contemporary art practices into civic heritage, I thought, well, there's something I can do here. Um, and it was my focus was really oriented around building bridges, uh, creating partnership opportunities, building relationships, because the museum, um, although had done um, a remarkable amount of work to contemporary, excuse me, to contemporize uh, not only the organization but to sort of reposition themselves um, as um, a, an active an engaged community contributor, um, there was still, and there still is today, uh, some limitations around just who feels comfortable in the space within the museum, who is drawn to that space, who feels that their stories are being shared, and equally who feels that their stories are not being shared in that space. So um, it, it was critically important to me and to my colleagues in the museum that we really start a process to um, sort of pivot uh, our, our understandings to pivot on the foundations of the museum, how it had been built. Um, museums around the world exist because they're part of a colonial um, mindset, they're part of a colonial machine, if you will. And museums are really there to sort of, uh, you know, carry the, uh, at least at that, you know, at their origin point to carry the dominant narratives within any community. So it begs the question, who is writing the histories, right? Um, so we're, we're in the mode and we're in the mo mode uh, about a year ago, um, just at the cusp of sort of starting to put some processes behind really significantly changing the approach to the work that we were doing in the museum. Um, we were in a, a hyper sort of conversational place where we were uh, having lots of conversations across lots of spaces that talk about intersectionality. We were really, um, you know, really, and we still are, frankly, on a very, very long, I call it a forever journey uh, towards, uh, towards another place. And really where, where we land, whenever we land as an organization will will be much further into the future and beyond the time that I will be in the museum or any of my colleagues I can predict. So, um, so it is a kind of forever journey. And uh, when the pandemic, um, you know, became central to our awareness in March of last year, um, and, you know, all of a sudden, like all of us, our museum was shut down, um, everything was canceled, everything was suspended, we were in sort of like a, um, you know, on in a sort of immediate hiatus in the work that we were doing sort of day to day. Um, the urgency with which 
we needed, we felt that the museum could and needed to respond to the community was overwhelmingly um, sort of asserting itself. And so we approached sort of at that moment um, uh, an interest and a need to uh, sort of catapult the planning that we were doing up until that point, which wasn't sort of very publicly available, wasn't sort of a, tr a transparent piece of the work we were doing in the museum, but we had a need to make it very transparent and very accessible. So I'll get into talking about the rapid response collecting program specifically, but wanted to create some space here for Queen to also reflect on where she was um, just ahead of the pandemic and, and the work that you were doing, Queen, in our community. Thank you for that. Um... I'm really just honored to speak on Guelph Black Heritage as a whole, um, honored for the ancestors that created our space in 18, um, the early 1800s. Um, what's so amazing about this um, building is, you know, when me and Dom were creating this presentation was taking a look at these buildings side by side was probably the first time I've ever seen this. And the first time I've kind of taken an opportunity to look at architecture as a whole and maybe think about um, the history and the connection between, you know, the black stone quarries and those who laid the bricks of Heritage Hall who may have laid those same bricks of uh, Guelph Museum. So that, that, that's a very interesting story that came about this project, but I am enlightened to see where that goes. Um, but a little bit about Heritage Hall, it actually was formerly known as the Baptist um, Episcopal Church. And it actually was created by former enslaved people who escaped uh, slavery through the Underground Railroad and came into Guelph, what we know as Queen's Bush. And they actually took, um, you know, we're, well, rather not take, took, but uh, were given land from our indigenous brothers and sisters within Guelph, Fergus, Waterloo, like spread out so far, what you can imagine. What we know today is, um, you know, maybe what John Galt built, but what we know to what we know is what their indigenous and black brothers and sisters had built. And this church holds a lot of history. It's a safe haven, not only for our ancestors, but it's a safe haven for our community now as Heritage Hall. Um, you know, looking back to pre COVID is very interesting. Um, the space was so full. And I think that that's the something I'm really missing is just being in the energy of this space when you walk in and you can feel the souls and the stories that have been told within this space for years and hundreds of years. And now we are in a place so different from that. But before Heritage Hall was really about maintaining this beautiful building. Um, with old buildings comes a lot of maintenance. Um, once it's a Canadian heritage spot, it comes with a lot of rules and regulations around maintaining, which means a lot of cost. So a lot of the time it was about restoration of the heritage hall while also working towards education and community support events and you know, really trying to get people engaged in culture and history. Um, a month prior to the murder of George Floyd, I had joined the Her um, Guelph Black Heritage a little bit more than what I'd been doing, just volunteer work on social media. Um, I had been asked to work a part-time job with them just doing some administrative duties because I'd been doing the social media and, you know, everything changed. And I think for us, uh, the pandemic really allowed a space for us to raise our voice that we haven't been able to. Uh, my role went from administrative assistant work to, um, you know, tackling racism, what feels like every single day. Um, but what's beautiful is the moment I step back into that building, I'm supported by my ancestors on this journey. And it's part of that calling, right? It was because of them, I can do the work I get to do now, like speak at lectures and speak to city members and elected officials. We didn't have those opportunities before. And I think what Guelph Museums and GBHS really realized this year is that we were telling, um, a narrative in the wrong way and we wanted an opportunity to be able to tell our story that wasn't written history so often written by the victors and unfortunately a lot of those victors are racist white males who are part of the colonial structure and we're working to dismantle that and i think that's what Gulf black heritage is really all about now is while maintaining the structure throughout a pandemic is you know social justice work education um and then what we realized was the importance of archival work and tracking the history and the stories that we need to maintain for our own people, whether that be through Guelph Museums. Um, and thank you to Guelph Museums again for acknowledging the ways that they have um, needed to do better. 
um, not very many people have done that in Guelph museums was on the ball about how they were going to dismantle within their own systems and that's why we're working with them and and that's why I have so much respect for them as well and I think it takes um, what Guelph museums is doing is taking allyship to accomplice and that's what this relationship has become about. Dawn is my friend behind bars with me, not the one bailing me out. She's uh, with me on this journey too. And I'm so excited as we journey through what rapid response looks like for the BLM movement. Queen, when you call, I answer. <laughs> How can I not? How can you not? Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, you know, rapid response collecting as a um, as a program of work, if you will, as a call to action, both for the museum and for the community at large, um, really emerged out of that space. Um, what I would like to say about the slide that you're looking at currently is um, is that. This is a, a, you know, a section of our, of our sort of invitation to community that appears on our website. Um, it's not all of it, of course. It, it's much longer than what you see here, but I wanted to sort of share the salient pieces with you in this presentation. And again, I won't read uh, what's on the screen there. I certainly encourage you to, um, to read that um, of your own volition, and also you can find it on our website. Um, and, uh, but what this, uh, but what this first act was, was to sort of acknowledge the pandemic, the COVID-19 pandemic as a major moment in history. And to acknowledge that we are having a shared, although diverse, uh, lived experience. Uh, that there are, there is, um, a, a kind of, um, overwhelming, um, uh, sense that we are, you know, Although diversely and differently affected, we are in this thing on the same path, moving in a gen generally in the same direct direction at the same time, which was not a feeling, frankly, that I had had um, when I was in, you know, continue to reflect on this. It wasn't a feeling that I had ever experienced before um, in my personal life, in the work that I do professionally, in, in, in my sort of community uh, and personal networks. I, I hadn't had that sense that it was sort of um, this driving force that was really um, affecting directly everybody simultaneously, although at different to different degrees. So um, the first phase of rapid response collecting was very much about the pandemic itself. Um, it represented for the museum a significant, a multiple significant shifts in the way that we do our work. Um, we moved from a, a what, what I would describe as a passive collecting process into an active collecting process. So by passive collecting, I mean that you know, we didn't, uh, although we encouraged and kept, um, kept ourselves aware of maybe um, individuals and, or organizations or groups of people that were sort of holding pieces of our local history. Um, we were interested always in talking to those individuals in learning what, what they wanted to share with us and hopefully maybe one day adding some of the artifacts of their lives to the collection. But we, but we didn't, um, often engage in an ask or in an invitation for people to offer in a very uh, direct way. Um, so oftentimes what happened was it was, you know, the, the individuals in the community who saw themselves already reflected in the space within the museum were most often the people who were approaching the museum um, without being invited. Uh, necessarily specifically invited to contribute. They felt comfortable in the space. Um, you know, overwhelmingly, it won't surprise you to hear that many of our donors um, to the collection are, uh, w uh, you know, white settlers, who, some of whom are part of the, the, you know, the first white families that came to this area and are, are um, you know, contributed to the building of the earliest uh, days in Guelph. Um, many others and multiple generations since have come um, to settle in the Guelph community. Um, but nonetheless, there is a sort of over overwhelmingly Euro white settler narrative very much present within the collections in the museum and absolutely present within the space itself when you walk into that building. And so what we what we saw in the early days of the pandemic, which was aligned so well with our our existing commitment to decenter those narratives, um, was a sort of urgency around creating space and opportunity for people to self self author 
their experiences. Um, and we can do that where it, when we're in direct dialogue with individuals who are, um, you know, ready and willing and feel like it's a, it's a, it's a, um, a valuable thing for themselves personally to engage in a conversation with the museum, to share their stories, to offer images, creative expressions, and other materials of their lives to the museum with the interest that 50 or 100 or 500 years from now, who knows, that people um, in our futures will um, be interested in that historical information or what information and, and stories are shared and carried within those artifacts um, that live in the museum. So that's what this um, rapid, the first phase of the rapid response collecting program really was designed to do. Um, and I wanted to share with you just a, a, a selection of some of the um, photographs, some of the material expressions, creative expressions that have been um, offered to the museum. And, and I've selected just a, a very small number of things to share with you tonight. Um, I wanted to um, sort of plant the seed around sort of just how broadly we are interested in collecting this moment because I think oftentimes what happens is that uh, folks who have never thought that their material possessions or their experiences and ideas necessarily would be of interest to a civic heritage space and I am very happy to tell you and I hope everybody's listening intently um, that the museum is interested in every kind of experience that our role is not to um, make a assumptions about about uh, the value of your experience beyond what you want to share with us um, and so what we started to see through the rapid response collecting program um, was this kind of um, some material that we wouldn't necessarily have seen previously so for example what you're seeing on your screen right now is just a snapshot um, I say just a snapshot because it's really very you know it was a very simple responsive sort of impulse to capturing an experience as it was being lived um, this image um, is by a person in Guelph called Janice Boyer who is also the donor of the uh, of the image itself um, I will point out that all the titles that you see on the slides today come from the uh, submissions by the people who are making those submissions to the museum so it's their language their wording their phrasing um, one of the things that we're trying to shift and change is not to assert the museum's voice on top of all the stories that are being submitted um, because we're also part of this learning journey and we need to um, we need to make space and priority for self-authorship in that space um, and you can see of course uh, you know uh, somebody you know the, the person's thumb in front of the uh, partly obscuring the camera lens um, which I thought was um, actually just you know, it was coincidental to this image being taken, but oftentimes um, it's emblematic of sort of the urgency of the moment, right? It's really just about capturing these empty bare shelves um, in a grocery store in, you know, our, our local community of Guelph. One of the things that also is very interesting about this image to me is the fact that there is, is almost an entirely fully stocked um, shelf of bottled water at the end of this uh, long empty shelving unit um, which is really uh, interesting uh, from the perspective of sort of Guelph's um, environmentalism, Guelph's um, awareness around sort of water security, water health um, and water knowledge. I mean we're all uh, collectively on a different in a different place in terms of those knowledges but nonetheless there is um, the sort of uh, the narrative is larger I think than even possibly the person who uh, took this photograph in the first place uh, thought that they were capturing in that moment um, but that certainly drew our attention thought it was really emblematic of, of our community I'll move to the next image which includes um, a painted rock uh, and if you are someone who has been out on the trails um, and on the streets and just sort of walking around whenever you can get a moment to be outside and escape sort of the the close confines of our of our lockdown spaces um, there was emergence at the beginning of the pandemic to really sort of reach out in um, what I would say are anonymous ways to to um, connect with people across sort of space and time but without imposing yourself or, or or your presence on another person given that we're trying to respect distance um, and I thought this was quite an artful image as well the way it was composed and photographed um, I will say that we have a, a number of photographs uh, now in the collection that are 
um, sort of expressing similar ideas around the painted rocks, but we also have some painted rocks themselves, which I thought was very interesting. Um, and an ongoing narrative with a number of people and organizations in the city who um, aren't quite prepared to give their rocks over to the museum as yet, but will later on um, once the pandemic is something we're looking at in the rear view, uh, will be interested in, in, in placing those objects in the collection. Um, this is another also really interesting example of a kind of creative expression um, in response to the invitation to sort of document um, a lived experience. Um, this person, Lisa Drury, uh, made multiple drawings. Um, I don't know how many in the total series, uh, in the complete series she's made, but she um, offered two of them to the museum. And uh, interestingly, uh, you know, she's titled it um, a life in 500 square feet. I think that's something that we can, regardless of the actual confines of our personal spaces, we can really relate to. Um, and also the notion that she sort of shared shared with us that this was a drawing from memory. So she was really sort of pictorializing or imagining that space how she might, you know, move about that space, what each of the corners of that space mean to her. And uh, as I said, there's actually a partner image to this image that um, lives in the collection as well. Um, moving on, uh, another great example um, by another person in the city here who thought, uh, who took actually a series of photographs, um, did some post-production on them. So they were shot uh, digitally. Um, I don't know if they were shot directly in black and white uh, format, but but nonetheless submitted them to us as a black and white series, um, which was really interesting too, because I think there is, um, and you'll see this right through the entire presentation today, an overwhelming sense that, you know, we are in a hyper visually literate era. And if, for example, I compare some of the imagery that um, we've received through the rapid response collecting program, to the almost 10,000 or more photographs that live in the Guelph Civic Museum's collection already, uh, there is a kind of um, just a like a really explicit visual literacy and a control and a command over how we're, we're sort of documenting visually through photographic means our life experiences. And I think that's something that over time is going to become a really fascinating part of our history. Um, there's a little bit of humor also uh, shared in this image, and I think that humor is something that um, is a is a really uh, important part of resilience and survival. Um, we have to find ways to uh, be, you know, access our humanity and to connect and relate to each other. And sometimes you have to laugh or you're going to cry uh, kind of thing. So I really appreciate the humor in that previous image. Um, this next image. Um, is part of a series as well. And I, I wanted to um, highlight a couple of things about this image. Uh, for example, um, you know, this fellow who is called Frank is the father of the person who took the photograph and also submitted the photographs to the museum. Um, and at the time of this photograph being taken, Frank was in a long-term care facility, uh, certainly with a, a number of um, health challenges. And there was, you know, as there has been right through the entire pandemic and continues to today, um, a lot of anxiety and a lot of uh, stress and struggle within the long-term care um, sort of community spaces. And, um, you know, there, there are many, many, many of us who have loved ones in those spaces, and not all of those spaces are safe, healthy spaces for those individuals to be. So um, I'm not making a commentary about this particular long-term care center, but it was important that um, June Wilson, who is the daughter of Frank, um, that, that she be able to connect in meaningful ways with her father. Um, she has been someone who has stayed in close and frequent dialogue with the museum. Um, that's not always the case with people we enter into these kind of conversations with, but she has stayed in touch with us. She was really, uh, if she was really compelled to let us know that Frank um, 
once it was safe again for her to re-enter the long-term care uh, center that he was in, uh, for him to, to be uh, removed from that space and to be to come home with her. So there was a um, an interesting uh, and very real kind of story arc that is now built into the record related to this particular image. So and that that is that's a pretty powerful um, opportunity to tell a very um, complex story that we wouldn't necessarily know or intuit or understand just by looking at a singular image such as the one you see on screen here. Um, I also chose uh, this image to share with you which is um, a photograph of a cuff bracelet by Guelph artist Andrew Goss. Um, it's called Fam Family Relations and in fact I wish um, we had space and time and opportunity for me to show you just about everything that had come into the collection, but it's not possible. Um, but I wanted to uh, share this one in particular because of the, um, the depth of detail um, and just the elaborate process of making such a beautiful uh, wearable object. Um, Andrew, uh, there, you know, there is a very healthy uh, silver and metal smithing community in Guelph that is, you know, um, decades and decades and decades old. Um, and uh, I knew Andrew um, uh, before I came to the museum. Uh, in, in, my, in my art curation life, uh, he and I had, uh, had met and talked a number of times. And I didn't actually know that he was responding in this way to the pandemic. And when he offered this uh, cuff to the museum, I was really, um, really just astounded. It's, it's an extraordinary piece. Um, it is a tremendous gift, um, as all the submissions are. And this one, though, is, um, you know, could just as easily, uh, you know, live in an art museum as opposed to a civic heritage space. And I wanted to acknowledge that because there is, um, you know, there was a decision that Andrew made to place this particular object within a civic heritage context as opposed to a fine art or to sell it commercially. Um, those decisions, I think, are really specific and um, Andrew has shared with us quite an extensive narrative um, around that and just why he felt it was important for the for the cuff to be in the civic space um, and to be accessible in that way and be part of the pandemic story. Um, I'll move on to this image as well. Uh, this is um, actually a screenshot from a, an article that was published in an online magazine, uh, Photographers Without Borders. Um, the article was written by a uh, Guelph uh, writer, uh, Maris Keeler, who is also the donor of the narrative to the museum. And this um, also represents quite a shift for us in the museum because if you can imagine most civic heritage spaces are really um, really really excellently good at collecting physical objects and we don't collect uh, born digital materials quite as easily or as well. Um, and so one of the things that we've had to do um, just in the last year is really quickly become proficient and develop a process around which we can support collecting of born digital materials. Um, in its initial offering, it's, um, it's a simple thing. We have, you know, big hard drives. We have lots of systems that back up that data. We have lots of ways in which we can keep and hold the data. But over the long lens of time, um, we have we have unique obligations as a as an institution that collects in the public interest and so we have to be uh, aware and mindful about um, digital media and exactly what is our obligation 50 or 100 or 500 years from now in terms of retaining what this object is um, so we're learning that as we go and it's a major priority for the museum I do want to say also that this, obviously, you can see by the title of the article itself, asserted um, a whole other, um, you know, multiple, you know, multiple levels of narrative into the pandemic story that we were interested in capturing from a, from a city perspective or community perspective. And, um, you know, you'll see or have seen already in just the images I've shared with you, this sort of sense of home, uh, which for, for many of us in the context of the pandemic is, is a safe place to be or safer place to be. However, there is uh, and there are many, many individuals for whom, uh, who, do, who do not have a, a safe place to go. So when we are under lockdown, when we are, are under stay at home provisos, there's a whole lot of people for whom 
you know, that isn't a possibility and it never has been or hasn't been in their lives for a long time. So, um, you know, to raise as a point of not only intersectionality, but as a, as a pivotal awareness within the pandemic ex itself, you know, for example, what is the museum's obligation to the people whose stories are being shared in an article such as this, which lives as a digital artifact within the museum, our, our narrative, our conversation is with the writer of the article as the author of the piece. But, you know, I raise the question around what is the museum's obligation to the people whose stories are part of that narrative and for whom we are not in direct dialogue or communication. So those, uh, those are ethical questions, they're moral questions, they're really practical also um, questions in terms of, you know, what is our due diligence to, to the entirety of that narrative and to the people whose lives are directly affected by those stories. Um, this is another image as well um, by somebody else, uh, Justin Langel, Langel uh, in, the, in, uh, in the city. Uh, Justin is a photographer, uh, someone I came to know sort of just ahead of the pandemic and then we stayed in close dialogue, um, who submitted multiple images to the museum um, in response to the pandemic and the call uh, to community. Um, and this one really, I, I chose of a lot, you know, it was one I chose of a whole series um, and I think because it's not only a powerful image, but also echoes another sort of layer of a sort of safe housing question, uh, which again was there before the pandemic happened and the vulnerabilities um, embedded within those communities for whom safe housing isn't a given um, is really, uh, has really been, uh, you know, a, a point of challenge, not only for them in, as individuals and as families, but also for, uh, you know, for communities and municipalities, land, you know, um, landlords, people who own these spaces, uh, there has been uh, a great challenge and continues to be a great challenge around sort of safe, uh, safe places to live. Um, so the choice is, you know, do you pay your rent or do you put food on the table? Do you clothe your children? Or do you pay your rent? You know, these shouldn't be the questions that we're asking in a time of crisis, but inevitably they become, they become those questions when we're in modes of crisis. And again, what is the museum's obligation to that narrative? Um, somebody said to me, or has, you know, I've heard this from multiple places actually, that museums should be mirrors of their communities. Well, I don't actually think that's completely true. I mean, I think we do need to be responsive and reflective in, in terms of some of the work that we do within the museum. But I also think that we have an absolute requirement to be active agents within our community, that we're not just there to sit back and reflect back what's happening in our cities, but to, act, to actively be part of the conversation. And then I chose to share this image with you, which is um, a photograph of a quilt. Um, it's, you know, the contrast between what we've just discussed in the previous uh, number of images um, compared with this one is not, um, is not, is the contrast there in terms of the representation of home and safety and security and comfort uh, is intentional. Um, but nonetheless, the, uh, the quilt that you see before you now is, is also a really fascinating and interesting object. Um, the, uh, there's a, a community in Guelph called the Village by the Arboretum, which actually isn't too far from the University of Guelph. Um, and uh, there are you know, dozens and dozens of people within that community who um, gathered together, um, Made, a, made over 2,000 handmade masks. And with all the scraps from the handmade mask, decided to make a quilt. So they didn't want any of that material to go to waste. And they also wanted to sort of, you know, very mindfully map their experiences and their response to it. And just the notion of community uh, and community caring um, into an object like this. Um, you know, we were interested in this particular object for many, many reasons. In fact, we haven't actually physically received the quilt as yet um, because the group that has made it is actively trying to share it throughout the community. So we have encouraged Anne and her and her uh, friends uh, and, and colleagues within the Village by the Arboretum to um, to share it as widely and diversely as they feel that they would like to. And then when they feel that that sharing has sort of reached its, its end, its natural end, that the museum will be ready at that point to receive, um, 
the quilt and to keep it for sort of historical posterity and to build it into the archive um, that we've been discussing tonight. Um, the, the history of quilt making is something that we don't have time in this conversation to do a deep dive into, but I do want to remark that it is um, uh, the impulse to make quilts, to make blankets, to um, to express narrative and story ex and experience in quilting or quilting practices um, is is age old and cross cultural. So. Um, you know, an object like this within a civic heritage space really calls forth a very, very long and diverse history of, of that kind of action. And so one of the things I'm thinking about as curator is how do we, how do we build that side of the narrative into an understanding of how to position this in history and in time. Uh, and I just have a couple of more images to share before I'll turn the presentation back over to Queen, um, but really did want to share this one. Um, part of what uh, helps us through these moments is is sort of the caring and the sharing piece of of what we do and uh, we were really really charmed um, uh, and honored to receive a series of images to show uh, how people were connecting safely with their loved loved ones um, this is the hug glove I think it has had many iterations um, and uh, it was, you know, this is July of last year, and it's been increasingly important. Uh, you know, we're just emerging literally today from a, uh, an immediate sort of localized lockdown where we are in the world. And, um, you know, we're just starting to sort of come out of our spaces and into um, closer proximity with our loved ones. And, and I imagine that Carolyn Ellis and her family have been getting a lot of use out of their hug glove. Um, we haven't collected the glove, uh, as you see it, pictured here uh, because it's in active use. Uh, we're not going to take that away from the families that are using this object. But what they did do too, which we thought was absolutely wonderful and fascinating, is they created a miniaturized, almost like a maquette version of the hug glove and offered it to us as a way to kind of show how it's made and it comes with a set of instructions and it's very, it's very helpful. Um, and not only to us to sort of share that story, but also for us to share it widely and encourage people to make their own hug gloves um, out of their, you know, out of safe materials, etc. too. So um, there's a series of photographs and also the miniature hug glove which will enter into the museum's collection. And this is the last image that I uh, prepared to share with you tonight from that first phase of rapid response collecting. And um, this one I'm sharing because, uh, and I won't uh, recite the poetry to you, but I'm aware that as part of this course, there is an invitation um, to the students to respond and reflect creatively or maybe in written reflection to, the, uh, to their own experiences, not only you know, taking into consideration maybe some of the um, lectures that they have uh, benefited from in the context of this course. Um, but to do so in sort of possibly in creative ways. And I thought, you know, here is an example of a, of a written um, creative expression, a poem by Dot Kohler, who submitted to us actually three different written pieces. And I just chose to share this one. Uh, and it most specifically, because if you see at the bottom of the uh, poem there, it says in response to a question, my glo global prosperity beyond GDP course. And I thought, that's exactly it, right? Um, sometimes, and I think what the pandemic is teaching us right now is that we have to make space for responding and reflecting in the ways that feel important to us at the time of that lived experience. Um, so, you know, it no longer do we have to sort of hold back on those things. And I think there has been an emergence of sort of like new creative learnings that a lot of individuals have had um, and are sort of you know, they're spreading their wings in those directions. And I think that's um, uh, hopefully for you a source of inspiration in terms of how you might re respond and reflect on your own lived experiences at this time. So with that, I am going to hand the presentation over to Queen. Hello, everybody. Thank you, Dawn, for all of that wonderful, insightful information into Guelph Museums and some of the work of Rapid Response. Um, Guelph Black Heritage Society has had the opportunity to work with Guelph Museums on a number of projects prior to COVID and leading, uh, leading up till now. Um, this was my first opportunity to work with Guelph Museums on a project and it was so 
uh, thrilling to see uh, another insight and another point of view and another way to look at history. And, you know, so much of my work pertains to um, honoring the history of our past and celebrating what we're living today. And I think that that's what this really does in a lot of uh, ways. Um, so we'll head over to the first slide here. Um, as I had mentioned, my, my role at the Guelph Black Heritage Society had really changed. Um, it went from administrative to assistant all the way up to an executive director role, something that um, I was definitely prepared to do. I've worked in the activism space for a very long time. And uh, whether it be in Toronto from BLM movements um, to um, you know, advocating for medical patients, working in so many different spaces, uh, HIV, AIDS, a lot of these things were, have always been of interest to me in advocating for voices that may not be able to be heard. Um, and, and this day, as you can see here, was a really important day to so many people and so many people in our community. The loss of Black lives and BIPOC lives within our community had been so burdened on us day to day, not only leading up to um, this moment in 2020 that has been so monumental, but for so much of our lives. At four years old was my first experience with racism. And that point, the way it was dealt with was that I was the one who was reprimanded and I was taught at a very early age on how the system worked. Um, and I was continuously taught that because I grew up in a home um, where, um, you know, bless their souls. I love them so much, but they are, you know, Italian and Irish. So what I look at in the mirror is very different that, than in my own home. And it was challenging for me to see the privilege that my brothers or my mom got over what I had got in any space, education, medically, um, you know, jobs, the list can go on and on on how so many ways I've had to work at creating my own space. And this day is monumental. We like to call it a watershed moment. Um, Many people ask me about what that day was like, and I don't think I could even recall really many of the moments because it was such a blur and such one of those experiences that um, I'm so thankful was captured by these photos and these images. And this first image here is a really important photo. Um, it recognizes our Solidarity March in support of Black Lives Matter on June 6th. We had over 8,000 people turn out in the middle of a pandemic. Um, I truly believed there was only going to be about a thousand um, and was hoping that we would at least get a turnout of a thousand people. And we got 8,000 people out on the streets and then we had 20k in viewership. Um, what that day told us is that people were ready to see a change. Um, what that day told us is that we were prepared as a society to look at life in a different way and through a different lens. And I think that this is what shows, you know, despite um, the pandemic. There was another larger pandemic that had been happening for 400 plus years. A pandemic that had been happening since I was a four-year-old girl and I had to live with every single day. And that day was such a release of anger, of frustration, of celebration, but it's monumental to see how many, <coughs> excuse me, how many people were there that day because Guelph is uh, predominantly white and to see our allies out there, to see them standing not only beside us but behind us and in front of us was so um, different than what we've seen in the past in these movements. Um, while I'm not, a, uh, a, while Guelph Black Heritage Society is not a BLM chapter, we are very much in support of the movement as a whole. It's really important to understand that Black Lives Matter is not a political statement. Um, Black Lives Matter is really um, trying to understand that we deserve, and that's it, we deserve, period. Um, and that means access. That means, you know, um, the list will go on as we kind of talk, but th this, this moment of solidarity and what it means to stand in solidarity with your, whether it be your indigenous brothers and sisters that we're seeing in the chat are going through 
so much within environmental racism, whether it's your black brothers and sisters, while it's your Ind Indian brothers and sisters who are suffering from their government out in India, we are seeing so much happen around our world that it's so important that we recognize those moments that we must stand in solidarity. And that's what was happening here. Um, and we'll head over to the next slide, Don. Um, so after this solidarity march, um, you know, it was really important and really historic uh, moment for Guelph. It was the largest protest we've ever seen in uh, this area in probably a long time between Kitchener, uh, the Kitchener Waterloo protest that brought over 20K and our protest was two of the largest protests in Ontario, despite BLM coming from Toronto and that movement being so predominantly from the States as well. And what we recognize is that while the protest was so highlighted in the work that Guelph Black Heritage did, or uh, the work of my team in support of these wonderful women who are behind it, that like, let me be very clear that this day does not go to just GBHS, but eight beautiful women behind the scenes, um, Desi, Tara, um, Scanlon, Sarah, Dee, Sarah, um, and Sophia. Um, and of course, Denise of the Black, Guelph Black Heritage, Marvel Wisdom, like so much of this day, and then so much of this day went to every single person there who was a black indigenous or person of color. And it was so important that when we had, you know, 10, 12 performers and people speaking, that's only part of the experience. Today, what I share with you is only part of my experience. I can only share my experience and I can try to advocate for others, but that's what we're really trying to do with this, through this rapid response collecting is recognize the importance of this monumental moment. And I think if anything, uh, you know, I said to Don the other day, it's almost like this movement is a rapid response in itself because it is so necessary that it happens and it happens fiercely and with robust energy and with um, uh, thought-provoking, tangible, actionable um, ways that we can continue the work. Um, and, and this allows a space for people to tell their stories. And so the rapid response collecting, as, as Don spoke to, is, is something definitely I've never looked at myself. And it allowed this space to um, be seen differently and through a different lens and through somebody else's story. So today I'm going to share with you some of the stories. Again, these are coming from me um, as much uh, as, as best as I can to honor the stories of those who have submitted. Um, and I am so grateful um, for that honor. Um, so, um, this picture is a panorama of the BLM Solidarity March. What you really see here is the active momentum of our city. Um, you can see here there are some people who are standing, you know, trying to keep their distance but still trying to be involved. You can see people who are heavily involved in the, the, the energy of the crowd right in the middle there. Um, but what this also shows is that life kind of got put on pause. You know, for a moment, the downtown area was just this. And so, you know, previous to um, COVID and that pandemic, previous to that, this might have not been able to happen. You know, people have work, people have life. Our black community is just trying to survive every day. And, and this allowed an opportunity for businesses to be on, put on pause, for city to be put on pause, for um, everyone to recognize and, and, and join in, I'll, I'll put in quotations, join in hands, because we couldn't really be do, actually doing that, but join in spirits and in souls. Um, towards the energy. Right now, um, what you see is everybody is facing the stage. Um, and I don't know if it's just me, but you can tell that everyone's intently listening. Um, there is, you know, so much talk about body language and how we read people even from the back. And you can just tell people are involved and listening and engaged. And, and, and so I think that that is such a brilliant part to recognize from this. Uh, 
This piece is a powerful piece for me. Um, Canadian Blood is such a powerful title. Kavya is, um, if you don't know her, she does amazing work with Hillside Festival in Guelph. She does outstanding work um, with um, our youth and our children in education. And I'm just so honored to share her piece here today. Um, this piece really like gets me in the gut. It really does. Um, it represents so much of what our community had been going through. Excuse me. Um, I've lost quite a few people, um, including uh, Regis Korczynski Paquette, um, who we lost last year to mental health. And this idea of I can't breathe weighs on us not only in the situations we saw from Trayvon Martin to George Floyd, but to the moments like these. to those moments where we have to worry about our people, when we have to worry about our partner, when we have to sit in this, this, this heaviness where you don't have a space to breathe. Um, and you don't even have a space to acknowledge the grief that's happening. And I think for so long, sorry all, I think for so long, this kind of idea of the heftiness and the weight that comes along with being silent. For so long that like silence actually is a part of everyday situations, whether that be in work when I'm told that my hair is too big, that my voice is too loud, that my spirit's too um, energetic, or, you know, the way that I, come off when I'm upset about something is an angry black woman and they don't know how to deal with that. These kind of microaggressions that we face. And this picture is pays tribute to the pain and the weight of what we're feeling. This um, shame and guilt that we're not enough or that we're not beautiful or uh, that we aren't ever going to have a space where this is fixed. But what I think I see here, and when I see this gentleman, and um, I'm so grateful for him because he was such a powerful spirit that day, um, is his bravery. And I hope what you get from this is the understanding how brave you have to be to put yourself out there, how brave you have to be to take what people think is like a terrorist group or a political stance and put that on the weight of your fingertips and of your soul and of your spirit. And that's what he did. He was ready for that battle. He was ready to not just fight against racism, but work about being anti-racist. You know, he's the one that's standing in front of you when the gun is shot. He's the one protecting you. And so that's what this expresses. And I think that that um, strength of a black man that we don't get to talk about or that is so misconceived in our media is represented here in such a powerful, brilliant way. I don't know about y'all, but I want that man in front of me when I'm going into battle, right? And I want that man next to him who refuses to be silent to be next to me in battle, battle. And I want that girl to know in the back that black is beautiful. And so when she looks in the mirror, she knows, oh, I don't even have to second guess. I don't have to put that as a statement. I shouldn't have to say black is beautiful to just know black is beautiful. Like, I don't know. 
I, I some days I'm like looking at black women and black men and I say to my roommates like I feel like I get it in ways because they're so brilliant. Black people are so brilliant and so robust and so energized and so beautiful in so many different ways. And 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 I think that that vulnerability right there. And and then the title. I think we should really talk about that because it's important to recognize that racism is Canadian deep. Canada is literally built off of the roots of racism of our indigenous brothers and sisters. Um, the policing is literally built off the roots of racism of our, um, not only our black community, our indigenous and our people of color and recognizing that this is Canadian blood that we're losing. Um, you know, the names go on and on and on of who we've lost, whether it be um, through murder, through the system. And, and the only difference that Canadian has, the Canada has, is that we don't collect race-based data. So we actually have more of a challenge when it comes to recognizing and making actionable change because Canada's like, oh, no, 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 the States is a problem. It's us too. It's us too. And if your Black brothers and sisters and your Indigenous brothers and sisters are saying this, stand with them because it's happening. Next slide, please. Oh, I just love this piece. I just love this piece. Um, it, I think twice, maybe three times on every call that we've reviewed this piece um, as part of this process, I've broken down. Um, and the reason that is, is because at four years old, I also experienced my first form of racism being pushed off of monkey bars and called the n-word and being removed from the public school and being told that it was my fault and that was my first experience so when i saw this story and this story was shared that at two years old she was called a racial slur by a four four-year-old come on four-year-olds are aren't built with hate Right? We're not, you know, we, we, we don't come out of the womb hating people. That's just, we come out of the womb wanting love, wanting food, and wanting to poop, and that's it. And those are standard things that we want as adults, too. And I think that as a two-year-old to even have to tell this story to your mother in some way, how do you even tell that story unless you've already had to have that conversation? which means that precursor to this racial incident, her parents have been having this conversation in the home at addressing racism. And then this situation happened. And, and it reminds me of my partner's daughter at four years old last year. She, she went to him and she said, dad, am I gonna be shot by a police officer? And he had no words because he couldn't say yes and he definitely couldn't say yes, but he also couldn't say no because the fact of the matter is, is that racism is so deep within, you know, society, within um, systemic oppression, within our institutions, that these situations are fears that we live with every day when we walk outside of our home, even at four years old. That trauma is going to sit with that girl her whole life. And the only reason I know that is because I am that girl. But what we see is this First off, I'm going to thank the mother because this writing is obviously not done by the child, unless it is, in which case somebody hire her because, but the mother evidently just took that message. And instead of allowing a space where we continually look at that hate, she changed it into this opportunity for a revolution. And just recently, I watched that movie Across the Universe again, and they're talking about, we're waiting for a revolution. And I couldn't believe that, like, the comparison in the worlds of, you know, years apart. And the world is coming to a place where we can love in, in color. And that I can be proud to say that I'm a Black woman without the fear of someone coming for me. Um, and, and it is time for a change because that two-year-old girl shouldn't be doing that. 
period. She should be watching backyardigans. She should be playing. She should be uh, like watching silly YouTube. She should be eating good food. She should be laughing. And she should be not put, holding a sign telling her story at four. Um, and so I think we have to seriously think about what this means when we look at our children and their experiences too. Um, and so I'm so thankful that they shared this story and um, I honor um, this family. I love this. Um, BLM Hearts. Um, this piece is a little bit of greatness for me, but it's also a little bit of grief. There's greatness in the celebration that, you know, the heart is always something that we love, right? It brings on love. It brings on joy. It reminds us of chocolate. It reminds us of good things. But, you know, parts of me also thinks about the hearts that have been taken. Um, the hearts that have not gotten to live out their story as they should have. And when I think of that, I think of how many hearts she might have had to create to tell those stories, right? If, if, if instead of the sign saying Black Lives Matter, it had said George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Regis Korczynski Paquette, Trayvon Martin, um, Cynthia Satoya Brown. I, I, and, it, it, and so parts of me um, feels a lot of pain. And I think that that's how What's great about um, photography and about these ways that we tell stories is how we interpret them. One way is this beautiful love story of community coming together. And then on the other hand, which, you know what, I can't say I saw before until today, I just felt this like, oh. and, but it also reminds me that The way that we can move forward is through love. You know, it's, it's the love that we have for each other that makes these monumental changes. Um, it's, it's the love that we choose to put into the work that we do, just as Ryan and Sophie are into this, this work and this, um, beautiful course. There's love, there's passion, there's spirit and energy behind it. Um, and, and I think that's what's so behind the Black Lives Matter movement and so behind grassroots and so behind organizations like Ralph Black Heritage and so behind the work I do is this love and, and, and wanting other Black, Indigenous and people of color to feel that love too. Um, BLM place cards. So I'm going to drink out of my don't be a racist bleep cup. It's a really great one. I love it. I won't say the swear word on, on online, but it's a great <laughs> piece that I got gifted. Um, so this is actually a pretty interesting piece because, you know, this Black Lives Matter cardboard on your right hand side really kind of gives me these like really vintagey vibes almost like did this come from another era of another protest um and i think that's what i love about it is that it tells this kind of continuous story of the movement as as we recognize it right it's a movement it continues this kind of breath of air and this kind of flow and i think that's what that kind of gives us um amongst the flowy of nature of the writing um but then just next to it is i am not a threat um and I'll, I'll speak to this a little personally, you know, my partner and I, we have been on and off for six years. We've been together now again, and we've been through it all in terms of racial moments. And I remember this moment down at Eaton Center, downtown Toronto. And if anyone doesn't know Toronto, like it's like being in New York Square, just like a little less crazy, but everyone's jaywalking, everyone's everywhere. It's just hectic. 
And I remember that day being out with, out and about with him. He is a beautiful melanin infused black man um, with long dreads, very tall. Um, and we were walking along the street hand in hand. We were crossing, I was jaywalking, but as was everyone else. And we got stopped by the cops. And we got ticketed that day for jaywalking. And I remember looking around and being like, look at all these people, like, are we actually serious? But what that enforced was this moment where they checked us from top to bottom. They searched every pocket of my partner. They asked for our ID. They tried to card us even though it was illegal. They, when we argued that it was illegal to card, it got even worse. And that's when we got ticketed and like tried to argue it in court. And, and the reason that was is because they saw us as a threat. They saw something else about us that made them assume that there was more to the story. And there wasn't. And, and, and those moments are so traumatic for people. Each of those moments, you know, uh, you know add upon each other. Every time I see an officer or security, it doesn't matter if I'm the most behaved and sometimes I'm my bad behavior, but like any time I am, I could be doing community service. I could be on this call and a police officer will walk through my room and I will immediately try to shut my energy down, try to push that attention off of me because so often I'm seen as this. And, I, and so often I've experienced this within a workplace. I've experienced this within artistic spaces. I've experienced this so often with white men when I'm working in political spaces and they've heard me on the phone, they've talked to me through email, then they meet me in person. And it's like, hey, and immediately body language changes. And I think that it's really important that we also acknowledge who this came from. Alexis Charles is an amazing, beautiful black woman in this city who um, has experienced her own forms of racism. And I think that this is really important to recognize because what has been taught throughout history and what has been taught to us in the media and what has been posed to us is this really, really terrible, misinterpreted, racist view of black bodies. I'm not a threat. I'm not. Um, what's a threat is society's institutionalized racism. <laughs> That's the threat. Um, but because I will fight against that, I will always be deemed as the one who's radical, who's the threat, who has to be silenced. But as Don knows, and maybe as Sophie and Ryan know by now too, I am not one to be silenced. It doesn't work very well. Um, and, and in more importantly, I work to elevate those voices that don't get to be heard. So really important message here. Um, I think it's also really important we recognize that our allies are there and that they're standing together with us in, 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 in solidarity. Now, I do want to recognize that while there are allies, there are also people who work on performative allyship. And that means people who just showed up that day to show up and took a picture for their Instagram. And I, and I think that we need to recognize it needs to go beyond that. And I also want to recognize it actually needs to go beyond allyship. It needs to get into that space of accomplice. And, and that's what I talked about what Dawn was for me is that, you know, you have that friend who is sitting behind bars with you and committed the crime, or you have the friend who's bailing you out. Not that we're committing crime, but I want the person behind bars with me. I want the person who's willing to take risks without unearned benefits. I want the person who's willing to stand up against injustices. I want the person that's willing to step in front of me the moment racism happens. You know, just the other day I was at the LCBO and I got followed around. Did my roommate say something? Yep. Was she white? Yep. Was she more furious than I probably would have handled it? Yep. But she had to do that. If she had walked out and ignored that situation 
and said, oh, it's up for a queen. She can do it. This is the work she does. How about thinking about maybe immediately in that moment, it brought back all this trauma that I've experienced with police and I completely shut down. I can't speak for myself. We need people like this in the streets, recognizing their place as accomplices in this movement. And that, that, that piece is so important to this rapid response collecting because that's not what we saw in the civil rights movements. It's not what we saw in uh, of the loss of Trayvon Martin, Philando Castle. Um, we didn't see this 10 years ago. We saw allies here and there, of course, but we didn't see this. We didn't see this worldwide. And, and I think we also really need to talk about the fact that racism is the pandemic, has been, will be, Maybe in my great, great grandchildren's lifetime, it might not be, but it has always been a pandemic. We are losing people left, right and center um, um, to mass incarceration, uh, to violence, uh, um, to the systems that be that put them in the situations that um, leave them in places that are hard to get out of. And we need our accomplices to stand up with us and stand together with us. And more importantly, stand in front of us. It's no hiding behind me. I need you in front of me because I'm going to be in front of you. And sis, I have been in front of you, in fact, for so long, taking the brunt force. And we're, we're tired, right? And, and, and this, I think, will allow people to uh, see a space for them as well because when wealth isn't necessarily the most diverse and there is a lot of uh, you know, white bodies, we have to recognize that they need to see themselves too and, and allow them to continue the work that they're doing. Mm. So as I said, this day goes out to more than just myself and the work of Guelph Black Heritage, I so often am the one that gets to talk about the protest. Um, Desiree is an Indigenous, Latina, Black woman, mother, inspiration to me overall. She has this beautiful son that I wish we had a photo of them somewhere. Hopefully we can find one and actually submit it. Um, but her son comes to every protest we went to. We went to like eight and he was there every time, four years old, sign in the air protesting and he is just such a powerful force and he's been surrounded by really powerful women um, uh, really trying to guide him in that work but this piece written handwritten speech I'll give you a little backstory is that you know Desiree has no experience in this and then we're to asking her to speak for her indigenous community in front of what we thought was going to be only a thousand is now eight thousand you know um, most people say people have a bigger fear of public speaking than they do of sharks and that they do of spiders. And, and this, this was a big moment for her. Um, and this was a big moment for her community. I think one of the things we faced in the protest was a lot of backlash um, towards Desiree and another person, Tara, who originally started it. Um, Tara is a white woman, but Desiree is not, but she's white representing. But people kept attacking her, um, saying that you're not in the right place, but rather she actually represents BIPOC as a whole. And so she was trying to find her space within that. Where do we find our space as white representing? Where do I find my space as a woman um, who is of lighter skin, who is raised in a white household that gives me, you know, more accessibility than most, that gives me more privilege. And so having this opportunity to also work through that, I think was really important for us as organizers and as leaders. Um, and I think just seeing this piece um, and knowing that this wasn't typed, it was just like, she sat down, she thought, she wrote, right? A lot of the time, those kind of handwritten pieces, not that typing doesn't, and I'm not coming for anyone because I often just type at my computer, but there is something so special about handwritten piece, this kind of head to hand to heart, right? This flow through the body of a story um, onto a piece of paper that can now be told and that, that her son will get to one day see. Um, and I hope she knows how proud we are of her. 
Um, and, and, and these speeches were not easy, um, as is retelling these stories are not easy for us either um, in any space. So I do want to recognize when you are requesting those moments, as Ryan and Sophie so lovingly did, was, you know, being, and Don, sorry, I shouldn't leave you out of this, was recognizing my space as trying to tell these stories. They're very traumatic. They hold a lot of weight. They hold a lot of pain, but they also hold so much impactful stories that are so important to tell. And that's why I do the work, no matter how hard it is on my soul, is that these stories that you, I mean, we can't quite read all of this, but what you should know is that speech was unbelievable to witness. I got to witness this girl who was in a situation where her partner believed she shouldn't be part of the protest because he didn't like black people. She was with a man who was racist having to deal with being attacked for the lightness of her skin in the conversation of colorism, not only from our allies, but from our BIPOC community, um, from losing her home and trying to come out of that and finding a place for her child. And now she has a car, a home, is back in school, is doing all this success. This was a monumental change. And I just want to share that I talk to her about sharing her story before I shared this. Um, and, but it's important to know that while the protest is impactful, the people are impactful too. None of the protest organizers knew each other. There were eight of us. We did not know each other. We just, Lord given brought us together by divine entanglement. And to watch her transformation come from this impactful moment is just so brilliant. And I watched her son go up to her, hug her after the protest and said, I'm so proud of you, mommy. And that moment will live in my heart's memory um, forever because it was really special. Another beautiful piece by Kavya. Um, this is called Looking Up. I apologize if I get emotional again. I'm not oh, normally this emotional. Um, but I feel like I'm in a safe space because I adore these lovely people. Um, and I can see the lovely comments, so I also know I'm in a safe space. But I don't know their story. Um, but I can feel it. Do you know what I mean? Do you know when you see that and you're like, I don't even know, need to know what's going on. Or you see a person in the store and you're like, there's something up with her. Maybe I should just go compliment her sweater. Or the other diet day, my chiropractor wasn't, just seemed down, so I bought her a plant. Went out, bought her a plant, brought it back. Right, you can just sense when people are telling their own story. And this is what that is. I think what's interesting is that we have this opportunity to see black and proud on the father's shirt. Um, this is a father and son, just some background information. Um, and while you can't read anything else, I think that this moment is so important because so often the, the story and the narrative around black men gets dimmed um, and it gets forgotten and it doesn't get the celebration that it deserves. I am personally obsessed with black males. That's just a personal thing. <laughs> I'm just obsessed. I love their beings. I love their spirit. And, and what I think I love most is this sense of protection. And maybe I'm a little biased because I am black too. Um, but, you know, what you see here is something really interesting. You see this connection between son and father, a, a narrative that so often gets almost um, demonized about fathers within black homes. Um, and what we saw in the pandemic is white families struggling with their children at home and black families thriving because we've had to for so long take care of our own from home because we not maybe didn't have the financial ability food security housing security whatever those measures may be um while reminding you that black does not equal struggle um but um you know this really shows the story that i love that there are just so many beautiful black fathers and 
and they're not just these men we have to watch as trauma porn lose their lives on TV. They're not men just behind bars. They're not men, um, you know, on the streets. That's not their narrative. Their narrative is proud, strong, intelligent, um, uh, successful. Um, and, and this representation of his, his son with dreads in his own being, in his own culture, embracing his own heritage means that at home there's a space for him to be who he is. Um, and it, it's a space that's scary because we've seen kids and adults all get reprimanded for their styles of their hair. We've seen it happen in school systems, even in the last couple of years from Peel to Guelph to Toronto, it, the list goes on. So to be sitting in your excellence is so beautiful to witness. But then again, I feel this half pain um, because every night, you know, I go to bed and, you know, whatever you believe in is fine. I personally am a strong believer in God and the blessings that he's given me, but he's also given me a lot of trials. Um, and he never gives me something I can never handle. I can always, I will always be able to handle it. But every night I look up and I say the names of those I've lost in my own life. Um, and those names we have not heard of, especially within our indigenous brothers and sisters, so many on the highway of tears that we've lost, so many indigenous sisters. Um, you know, so many of our black brothers and sisters in our Caribbean and African countries and across the world. This is not something that's just happening within the United States. And for them to look up, it pains me to think that they're looking up to someone that they've lost and that that kid and that that man has to go through that. Um, and I want to recognize when we lose someone in our community, it might as well be my own brother or sister. And I say that because they are my own brother and sister. So so often this kind of conversation around like, I'm gonna do everything for myself happens in this world. I gotta take care of me. But we are one in one. Your energy affects my energy, my affects you. And so that, that energy gets carried on through our generational pain, through our DNA. And so every pain of my ancestor I feel and every loss of my brother and sister I feel and every trauma of my brother and sister, I feel that chip in my heart break. And that's that witness to this, is those moments that we get to remember those that we've lost. Remember those who have made in, in, impactful stories, those who were heroes to me, those who are my inspiration this allows the story to continue to whomever they're giving honor to. I'm recognizing that I talk a lot, but I'll move through these. Um, this is a really important one, police chief. Um, I actually want to recognize that I actually no longer call him the police chief. Um, I want you to think really, really critically about the words and the languages that we use in the spaces and recognize maybe why police services use the word chief as their leader of position and recognize where policing came from. Um, I only leave the word chief for my native community um, elders and brothers and sisters and not for the police service. But Gordon, uh, Gord Kobe has a lot of work to do in terms of racial inequity in terms of um, everything. I think it's a system that no matter what he does, whether or not he wants to try and do good, we have to abolish a system. We have to defund the police. We need to work on reallocating funds to necessarily necessary things. Crime happens before the police show up, always. You're not committing a crime as a police officer watches you, <laughs> like you're just not doing that, right? So that means that we have to work on preventative measures right, to prevent these things from happening. Food security, housing, homelessness, um, uh, racial equality, um, uh, 
financial, education, the list goes on and on on the things that we need to work on in terms of equity in our spaces so that we can allow policing to have a different um, look. I could speak on policing for hours. <laughs> I really, truly could. Um, but um, I think what we're seeing is that they're open to the conversation. I think that's what's important. Whether or not I personally want to have the conversation with them, they are open to it. I don't know how much learning will come from that. I think there's a lot of work that needs to be done because we're battling unions. It's not just policing. We're battling a union. We're battling a police act. If you ever wonder, why is the police officer not fired? Why is he still getting paid and he shot that black child? Well, a police act is protecting him. And we need to work on abolishing those systems. And until I see the police services stand up within their own service and start petitioning and start protesting and start doing the hard, heavy work, um, I don't see anyone really having tons of respect for them during this time, right? They have to be a part of the heavy work. They can't just sit back, get paid and keep arresting people. They have to commit to doing that education, to doing anti-racism, anti-oppression training. They only do literally 30 minutes of that within all of their block training that is three months long. Um, so things definitely need to be changed. So I'm proud that this was said. This is, um, for those who don't know Guelph, um, one really big piece about Guelph is our university. Um, the university is a place that I like to call home as well. I'm a graduate of alumni, I guess, of the University of Guelph. Um, and it is uh, two things. One, it's like the city is a different place when our students are around. It's a, like, twice as many people. It's bustling. Our downtown is always, like, very busy, very impactful. I, you know, the students contribute to so much of the wealth of Guelph. Um, and, but yet on the other hand, they're kind of almost in this, their own little bubble, right? Everything on campus happens on campus. And we really need to recognize that the students are standing here, particularly these young women with their place cards, um, to combat the racism that has been happening on our campus for years, from the time that I've been there, from the time precursor, to leading to now, it's sad how many stories I get in my DMs of people of experiences, not only from you know their fellow students, um, but from campus police service. And, and this is an important moment um, because I think so often that the students, the black students don't feel like they have a voice. And this was a moment for them to stand in unity for that voice together and feel in a safe space. Um, and the university, um, while I love the work that we are doing, there's a lot of work to be done. Um, a lot of work. And I'm so proud of the work of Brianne Green Ice, who created the anti oppression, anti diversity training. Um, was uh, sad that we had to have that training implemented this year. It should have been much sooner. But I think this is a moment that allows me to know that the students had, a, had an opportunity to be felt. As you can see uh, from the first photo that we talked about, this kind of um, sea of protesters <laughs> is, is amazing to see. Um, I, I was truly astonished at how many showed up that day. And it's important to recognize that, you know, there are times and spaces that we can set aside government rules and we can set aside what we know to be the norm or what we know to be right and start working against that. I think, you know, my whole life I, I've been getting in trouble because I have been fighting against norms and I've been working to see things through a different lens. Something just never made sense to me. Why can't I dance in heels and dance sexy and feel good about myself and also be an activist? Why can't I do that? You know, um, people ask me that all the question, all the time, like you can't be doing this and that, why? Who said? Who said, right? And I think that this allows a space where we can, uh, you know, before policing, before government rules, there was a time when community worked together. And that's what we did. We followed rules, we kept to protocol, we did what we had to do, but then we also protested and we also raised our voice. Um, 
so we made these signs. I have three of them sitting in my own home. <laughs> um, but these are really important to recognize. Guelph is a very small city. The beautiful part about Guelph is that we have tons of small businesses. And what small businesses recognize is that because they don't have to fight against capitalism and against, you know, kind of the man that be behind institutional um, uh, companies, they could stand up for what they believed in and what was right to believe in, quite frankly. And so this was an opportunity also for our Black community to know who's safe, where they can shop safely, who's supporting safely. Um, I'm never scared of calling out those who are racist. I just called out a plant store the other last year um, that uh, was, a, was part of like kind of anti-BLM um, stuff here in Guelph and and we have to be able to call that out but we also have to be able to show that we stand in solidarity in any space so I know that when I go in that store I'm safe um, and, and I think that we saw tons of these this is just one of many we've been seeing and still see around Guelph um, so I'll show this first sign here and or sorry this this first slide here, you can see um, this BLM fist. I also have it on my arm here. Um, and the, these raising fists are really important. And Don, I'll have you go to the next couple slides as well as we go through this is, um, this was kind of the creation process of these aluminum painted fists. What we need to recognize, and I just wanna give space for this, is that when you are a white person, raising your fist can be something that you think might be right. <laughs> um, but it actually represents a lot in white supremacy. So leave the fist raising to the black communities when they're in protest. But what this allowed was for, um, you know, our allies to be able to do that without having um, to necessarily uh, partake in the history of white supremacy. Um, and, and also these are just a really strong statement. The raising fist has been something that has been a part of history from even before the Black Lives Matter movement. Like I'm talking Polish times, I'm talking Spanish times, I'm talking like we're talking, it's been around since anyone fighting kind of political government or restraints. But it kind of became a, a moment and a story of part of the Black Panther movement within the civil rights movement in the United States. And it's really transitioned. It's a piece I got tattooed on me for life because it gives me this strength. It gives me this, um, I don't even know, it gives me this like queen and king power that I know we are, this royalty that I know we are, this, this, it automatically changes your body posture, right? Like we're not standing there like this, right? It changes the way that you're giving yourself to the world. And that's what I love so much about this. Um, this last piece means so much to me. That's me in the middle. Um, <laughs> so this piece is actually, it's sitting right there too in my room. Um, so this is probably one of the main pieces that came out of the protest. It was the trend. It was a very powerful piece. It started as a piece of photography by Alex and then his sister actually created it into a watercolor painting. And what I love about this is, um, and I apologize because I feel like I haven't left much space for questions because there's been so much storytelling, but what I do love about this piece is that it reminds us that Black Lives Matter, one, period, point, blank. Like there's no but, there's no but, are you, no, no, point blank, period. Yeah, remember that. <laughs> if you're gonna take anything from today, Black Lives Matter, period. Um, but I think for me, you know, the red really represents kind of like the blood of my sisters and my brothers who have so tirelessly been walking, chanting through, you know, being enslaved people through um, coming out of these trials and tribulations to leading to where we are now. But yet what I love about this piece is that you see this sea of melanin excellence in its finest. You get to see the colors that represent not only um, our souls, but like the history of our people from African and Caribbean cultures, the blues, the yellows, the blacks of our kente cloth and of our people, of our head wraps and of our stories. And, and this piece gives me such strength. Those bad days, I have to walk over to this piece in my living room and remind myself, 
this is why we do this. This is why we do the work. That strength of that woman in that moment is not the same strength I've had today, quite frankly. It's not the same strength I've had in the last two weeks. It's not the same strength I had two weeks following that when we had another murder of a black body. But that strength and that resilience that I feel like I've had to live with my whole life because I've had no choice but to be resilient through, you know, these kind of institutions is, is in here. And the strength of my brothers and sisters is in here. The story of my ancestors who have given me the opportunities to do the work that I do are in here. The streets that you see and, and kind of highlighting like the Guelph buildings and the street names is really important because those lands are indigenous and black lands. Those streets we walk on belong to our indigenous brothers who gave us opportunity for safety on uh, these Queens Bush lands. Walking and knowing that that downtown area could have been an area where my ancestor walked through. To know that the sweat and the tears of my brothers and sisters that now will sit on that pavement, on that hot pavement as we move through another year. I can't believe that we've already almost come to June again. But those blood, that sweat, that tear, those persistence, that, that resilience is sitting on that pavement. That that soul, the cries of the mothers and the fathers who have lost those to the systems and to, to loss are in the airs, in the energy of, of, of the earth. And when we look up to the sun, we're kind of reminded of this picture of the energy that the universe has always given black people. Sun is the way that we survive and heal. You know, melanin is, is something that the sun creates into our skin, that deep energy. And I think that when we look at pictures and when we talk about rapid response collecting and when we talk about the importance of history and, and, and capturing these moments in different ways, it's because of this. It's because of the feelings that it gives you. It's, it's, it's because those stories already mattered yesterday. Stories are happening as we speak and they matter before they even happen. And so the work that the Guelph Museums is doing, and I thank you, Dawn, again, and, and your whole team, um, is they've allowed a space that I never saw for myself. I talked about this with them in the first meeting. When I grew up in Guelph, there was nothing in a museum that looked like me. There was nothing in my home that looked like me. There was nothing in education telling me I'm more than an enslaved person. But a little black girl, that little girl that we saw in that other slide is going to go into the museum next year or whenever we're able to get these things together. And she's going to look at that picture and see herself. And she's going to know that she's worthy. She's going to know that she's loved. And she's going to know that she's enough. And then she's going to be that girl in the picture in five years when we're continuing this work. Or in 10 years or in 20 years. And so I urge you to not get complacent in this work because we are continuously losing lives every day from our black indigenous and people of color. We are continuously facing racism in all shapes and forms. We have to think about things like when we do Zoom events and having Zoom bombers of people who are coming in trying to give racial attacks online. These are things we have to think about. I have to think about when I leave the, my front door, am I coming back in? And so I urge you to start doing the work so that next year when we're back on this conversation, I'm still here. My partner is still here. My brothers and my sisters are still here. And so I thank you for this space, um, one, to be vulnerable. This work is not easy. Um, and these stories are not easy to tell. But what we see is that there is a new breath of life coming in. 
and there's a new care and empathy in the world that we haven't seen on all different levels. And if you continue that internal work, we'll be, become a better world way faster than if you start keeping the blame on everybody else. And so thank you so much. Wow. <laughs> um, I, well, just thank you both so much, Queen. Thank you, especially for the, for all of that. Um, I, I, yeah, I, I think, um, I just mentioned that I think it was good for us all to just listen, just listen, you know, um, I'm, I'm grateful that you take up the space that you do and that you are willing to come and, um, enlighten the space here. And so, uh, yeah, this was very, very powerful. I think a lot of people are commenting and thinking the same thing, which is, um, there's there's a lot of work to be done but there's also you know positive things happening in large part because of the efforts that you know that you continue and others continue to put in so i'm just extremely grateful um to have this opportunity tonight um thank you and i'm um always open i always tell don despite how many hats i wear and despite how many <laughs> Hours I work, I have, I think I'm actually quite good at responding quite fairly quickly to things. Um, Better than I am, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> Reach out any time and feel free if you do have questions following this. I'm, uh, you know, quite an open book and um, we need to have space to do that hard work and to get uncomfortable. And so feel free. I, I don't sleep. Patricia just asked if I sleep. I, don't. <laughs> <laughs> I literally work like 19 hours a day, every day a week. So I don't sleep much, but I think that, you know, one day I will get sleep. Um, and um, I thank Dawn because uh, she has been such a supportive accomplice for me and in these spaces and I wouldn't have been able to be so vulnerable without her. So thank you. If I could thank you too, Queen. Um, uh, so much of what you shared today and so much of who you are and how you um, embrace and invite the opportunity to collaborate and be and learn from each other is really the model that the museum is reaching for. And uh, really it, it has been through your effort and the effort of so many in your community, in our collective community, you know, the museum gets to do this work. It's a place of privilege and a space of privilege to do this work. And I'm just incredibly honored that uh, you know frankly to listen to you share again tonight um and, and you know each time i get to do that i learned a whole lot of new things and i think differently uh and so you know to do this kind of work to change to make change um it's a steady pressure on the go button it doesn't let up <laughs> so i thank you so much and i i i don't know if we have um I, I, I wasn't following the chat because I'm in presentation mode and I'm leaving it up there at the moment just because uh, we wanted to share with everybody just how close we are uh, in, in our downtown area. Um, you know, it, it's just a 13 minute walk from our two, uh, from our two heritage sites. And, uh, you know, we're coming out of lockdown. Uh, Queen and I um, are not always in these spaces in the way that we once were, but we certainly can be found very easily through the networks that live there. And we encourage you to, uh, to reach out. Um, uh, and uh, yeah, we just welcome welcome the opportunity. So, and I think if there's really um, essential questions that have surfaced throughout throughout tonight's uh, dialogue, um, I would certainly be very willing to um, to provide thoughtful reflection and answer um, to any of those questions. So, I don't know if you want to do that um, post haste <laughs> after after tonight's uh, tonight's sharing, but. Um, uh, I'll endeavor to make sure that I connect in and, and reply accordingly. Carl and 
Uh-huh. But while Sophie's just get, saying her bit, can you do you have our slides? I just want we wanted to show one other thing. Um, Let me just stop my share. Go ahead, Sophie. Yeah, um, thank you so much to both of you um, for sharing and allowing us to um, to listen and and be part of this and and for your generosity. Uh, this we saw in in the chat that this was um, no the most powerful panel we had not only this semester but since september um and and then the the, the beautiful um collection that you have and and uh, how much you, you 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 give it space and then you honor it and you um you care for it and so uh, really looking forward to seeing the exhibit as well um this was just an amazing amazing evening so so um powerful and impressed and, and honored to um that you have come to our class and and um what a i'll just say what a powerful and and and, and beautiful partnership between uh your two institutions and um really um showing us how much that can be done um in in partnerships like this and 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 just really inspiring um we, we have a slide preview about next week on the food systems and COVID-19 with Emily Duncan and Evan Fraser from Geography, and then Simon Samoji and Kimberly Thomas Francis from uh, Hospitality, Food, Tourism, and uh, Management. Uh, but we want to go to the next slide, I think. Yeah, it was the next one, this one. So, Brian, so those, yes, yes. Yep. Yeah, so um, if anyone is interested in learning more, um, uh, Professor Jade Ferguson is going to be giving a talk on Black Lives and Histories in Guelph and Wellington County on Saturday, I believe it is. Um, yes, Saturday at 7. At 7. And we checked before class. There were still some, some spots left to uh, register if you're interested. We will share that link with the it's class. It's over there. Like it's in the, the PowerPoint too, like the calendar link from the Waterloo Public Library. And there were like over 60 spots still left um, before class. So. I think we're both signed up for it. <laughs> and it's not to be missed. Dr. Jade Ferguson is Quite such the treat. an incredible, um, yeah, she's such a treat. And, and the, the history of um, Black lives in Guelph is fascinating, um, truly fascinating. So if you have an opportunity, I truly think you should go because um, you'll be as obsessed as I am with Jade. Yes, really looking forward to it. Um, yep, I will put the link yeah. in here. I don't know, Leslie, if it will be live streamed, that event. Like, I think you can go to the website and see the direction, whatever information they put there. Because I know, I know you're, you're ahead of us by a lot. Uh, Don, you were asking, Leslie's in Australia right now. So, so we really have people from all over, an alumni, an alum of the university, but in Australia. Um, yeah, so, so thank you so much, Ryan. I, I think we're, we're going to end the evening, right? There's no, there's no questions I would ask that would <laughs> be more insightful than what we already heard. So I think that's, <laughs> I think that's where we'll have to stop it. But um, again, thank you so much for this. This was, I said, you know, we said optional, but awesome. What? Or, or, Far beyond yeah. awesome. <laughs> it was it was optional but awesome. Our optional but awesome reading week panel. <laughs> totally great. So Thanks good. Thank us. you so much. Thank you. So much. Um, and thank you for the audience, uh, for, for for helping us create the space and 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 Don and, and Queen, uh, what a what a treat and, and you honor us uh, by your presence. Thank you so much. Thank you all. Thank you. Have a good night. Bye, everybody. Yes. Yeah. Um.